I started doing magic when I read a book from my local library, and then I read another book, and they said, hey, Sawyer, you know tricks. Do a show here. So I did a show at that library, and then the other libraries asked me to do shows, and I accidentally started performing. What I do is a combination of sleight of hand, comedy, and psychology, and that just happens from practicing sleight of hand in front of a mirror for years and years and years and years. So what I do is fun and special, but it's not real magic or evil or spiritual in any way like that. A deck of cards is a pretty dynamic object. There's a lot of fun things that you can do with it in a very small space. So it's quite economical in that way as a performer. Time for a card trick. This is how it's gonna work. I will drop the cards like this. I will show you a card and that will be your card for this trick. Good. Now let me tell you what's gonna happen. I will snap my fingers. Your card is gonna jump out of the middle of the deck. It will spin 10 times in the air and I will catch it right here. Ready? One, two, three. Whew! And I got your card, the Jack of Clubs. What? That's not it? Was I close? No? Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, what, what, what was the card? Four. Four of diamonds, who picks that one? Ooh, the four of diamonds! And I found your card! Magic! This is your card, and that's what I thought your card was. If I wave it like this, now look. Here is the jack, which means that on the table, the ripped up pieces is your card, the four of diamonds. Now if I take the pieces like this and squeeze them, Watch. The pieces actually go back together. And that's your card, the Four of Diamonds. I like to do magic with things that people have on them. Because if I bring out something, you think, okay, maybe that's some funky magician's toy kind of thing. But if I use your phone or your coin or your watch, you know it's normal and I'm showing you something special with something that you already know about. This is my phone. This is my case. This is my face. What makes it special for me is seeing how much people enjoy it. When you've got like a big tough guy in the front row and then he screams the loudest in the room like, ah, and he's freaking out. That's really fun to see. But some people, you'll do it and they just go, and they're messed up for like an hour and they go, I need, I need some fresh air and they walk out of the room. So people react differently, but it's, it's a very fun thing to be able to bring to a, a group of people. There's satisfaction from people appreciating what you've done and saying that trick was really cool, you blew my mind. But when they turn that onto you and they say, you're an awesome person, I wanna be like you. And I think, well, you don't really actually know me at all. And I go like, whoa, 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 this is, this is really weird. If you met me on the street, I'd be any other dude. But because I'm the guy on the stage, you're giving me this type of attention, uh, which is very weird to get out of nowhere. I recognize that I've practiced a lot to develop my skill this way, but I also recognize that I'm kind of wired that I have a natural gifting for performing and that God has made me this way. So there's a relationship between me having to work hard, but also knowing that I have to steward the gifts that God has given me. And so I'm always wondering, is this the right thing to do? Am I going to go this way or this way? And where do I feel God leading me? Let me show you something, but without my sleeves. I'll use this guy here. This is actually a coin a 50 cent piece. If I squeeze it, it turns invisible. It's still here, you just can't see it. If I give it a rub, it comes back. Now, if I rub it on my elbow, something different happens. It also disappears, but this time it goes behind my ear. Did you catch that? No. You probably didn't catch also the pen inside of the coin. No? <laughs> it turns back into the coin, back into the pen. And I also keep an extra coin inside the cap. Are you following? 
No. Let me break it down for you. This is actually all based upon optics, how our eyes pick up things. If I hold it here, you can see it. As soon as I bring it down, it disappears, but it's still here. When I do these tricks, I hope that I can show people these good gifts that God has given me, but also showing them through my life that God is amazing, that I'm doing tricks and these are fun, but they're not real. But God is real and God is amazing and he's done this thing through me and this is how I show it to the world. I'm Sawyer Bullock, magician or denier. Good morning. It's good to be together, yeah? In spite of everything that's going on in the world uh, this week, it's especially good that we can gather together and worship freely to a God who loves us, who stands with us, and who is worthy of every song and prayer and gift that we can bring. So why don't we do that right now? Would you stand with us and join us as we sing our songs of praise to a God who is worthy of all the love that we can give? soul, every beating heart, every nation and every tongue, come find hope in the love of the Father. All creation will bow as one, lift your eyes, see the risen sun, Jesus, Savior forever.
How good is it to sing? darkness my god that is who you are 
Father, God, we believe it this morning. We believe that you are the way maker. And we thank you for being the way that we can stand in that and to trust um, that you are with us in our grief, that you are with us in the mourning of a, a family member, in the midst of our depression, our exhaustion, our tiredness, Lord. You are the balm that heals our wounds. Father, we thank you for loving us and for finding us exactly where we are. And loving us so that our ashes can turn into something beautiful. Father, we thank you. and 
Wow, how, how beautiful is that, right? Our God takes our brokenness and makes it beautiful. Sometimes I think we, we feel like our brokenness is no good, is useless, is just a weight or an anchor to us, but God redeems that. I hope that is a message that we can stick with today. Hi, my name is Mark. Welcome to the Meeting House live stream. It is so good to be together today already. It has been um, just a powerful morning, and I hope and I pray that the rest of this time together is that as well. Um, good to be together. I know there are many things that you could be doing, many places that you could be, but you have chosen to spend this time together, and I am grateful for that. It is so good to be family together as we journey together. Okay, well, you have joined us for week one of our new series called Hope, and Jimmy's going to be kicking things off um, this morning talking about lament and what that means. And that ties in well to our month of prayer journey that we have just begun. Um, it's called The Road to Hope. And uh, if you don't know what that is, perhaps you're just joining us for the first time, you can go to themeetinghouse.com slash prayer. There are resources there that you can print off still and join the journey together. There's booklets, there's little prayer cards with different um prayers and reflections on them, things that are worth doing together. And I really love this, uh, this theme, this focus that we have on this month of prayer uh, called Road to Hope as we, um, as we walk towards, as we journey towards Easter. You know, sometimes I think that we can um, feel like we need to be, as Christians, hopeful people or people of joy or people of peace. And we think, well, we just need to be those things. We need to have those um, characteristics and we need to be that. But, but we, we often forget that they don't happen overnight, right? That we work towards these things, right? We have to walk along that road to hope right? We take that journey. And one of my favorite things about the way that we're doing it this month is we're doing it together, right? We are walking that road to hope together. And so I want to invite you to be a part of that. And one of the things that is happening as in this journey, in this road to hope is on Monday nights, 630 Eastern, we are having a time of prayer together. Together, It's just a short time, 20 minutes, where there'll be some activities. If you go and you download this at the in each kind of day, there's a, a resource list, things that you'll need. If you don't have those yet, it's very simple. Anyone can take part. And so I just want to invite you to do that. Again, you can go to themeetinghouse.com slash prayer to get that information. Don't be on this road alone and understand that this is a journey. We are walking towards hope and we can receive that uh, at the end of this journey. And today we start with lament and Jimmy's going to be kicking that off, as I mentioned earlier, which I think is really, really appropriate and beautiful for the season that we find ourselves in both around the world, maybe here locally or wherever you are, um, as well as in our community here at the Meeting House. So I'm very excited to be on this road together with you. Thanks for joining me. Hey, if you've been around at the Meeting House for a while, you know that giving is a part of one of, uh, it's a part of what we do here. It's a, it's a high value for us to live generous lives, um, both with our time and our resources, as well as our finances. And I just want to give you a little glimpse into uh, what that giving has led to, especially if you are at the meeting house and you don't have children in our KidMax ministry. Um, here's just a little bit of what the giving um, produces and what our kids experience um, through KidMax. Let's show that clip now. When we focus on Jesus, we actually love people better. I found this great community now where I just have these awesome friends. And that's really good news for us. That leads me to today's big idea. Jesus came to help the sick. Then your sins will be forgiven. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Through home, through school, wherever you are, you can experience God's love. His death on the cross and resurrection three days later is the most important event in all the Bible maybe all of eternity. Can you guess what it is? Yes! <laughs> it's a loaf of bread! Yes, Jesus uses a loaf of bread and fish 
to do a miracle. And he gave thanks to God. Thank you, God, for this food. All things are possible. Are possible. With God. With God. Mark 10, 27. Mark 10, 27. Fuck off. Game time. How many times can you say the key verse before the rocket lands on the moon? When we read about the life of Jesus, we see love in everything he does. Jesus, you are my rock. Turn to the person next to you and answer the following question. Question time. Who baptized Jesus? Baptism is how we tell everyone that we want to follow Jesus forever. God knows what we need. He's always with us and he can always hear us. We learn through God's creation. And if I can just love God and love others day in and day out, I think I'll be on the right track. Let's get into our small groups now. And See what this looks like in our own lives. <laughs> okay, I don't know about you, but no, I did not guess that that was a loaf of bread. My first instinct was taco, but maybe that's um, for another reason. But I think that is so amazing. So many incredible uh, stories and um, things that are being produced as a result of uh, your giving as a result of your generosity. And so if you want to be a part of that, if you want to contribute to that, if you call the Meeting House home, please go to themeetinghouse.com slash give for more information and check out what that means there. Okay, I'm going to throw it to the teaching and pray before we do that. And just a little heads up that before we go to the teaching, we've got another episode of Winging It with Winger where Daryl and I had a conversation this past week um, about how he is processing Lent um, in light of all the other things that are going on in our world. And I'm excited to share that with you. But first, let's pray, and then we'll head there. Father, we are so grateful for who you are, for your love for us, for the fact that you uh, hold us when we grieve, that you are near to us when we are hurting. Jesus, that you don't see us as broken, as... Um, as things to be discarded, but you see us as dearly loved, as unique, as special, as um, full of worth. And we are just so grateful for your love for us. I just pray um, for the rest of our time together that you would be speaking to us, that your Holy Spirit would be speaking to us in ways that we can comprehend, that we can understand you, that we can know you that we can experience your love in new and fresh ways. In your name, Jesus, I pray these things. Amen. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Winging It with Winger. I'm Mark. This is Daryl. Daryl, good to be together again today. Oh, thanks, Mark. It's good to be here. Yeah, so as we are chatting, we are approaching the Lent season. In fact, today is Shrove Tuesday. Lent begins tomorrow. Lent is this practice that we've received from the wider Christian church. It's It's been around for over 1,500 years, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. uh, typically been focused on this idea of fasting or giving something up in order to focus more on Jesus and God. And, and some people in our community uh, like to practice this. Mm -hmm. Now, I have taken today to eat as many donuts as I can because this is something that I'm not going to be able to eat starting tomorrow. Oh, now, some people like to add things. Some people like to fast from things. Just wondering, are you participating in Lent this year at all? Yeah, I, I really do uh, value an experience like Lent because it does let us focus on Jesus. Mm. Uh, I'm adding uh, to my uh, spiritual practice each day a series of poetic readings uh, that focus on Lent mm -hmm. and focus on Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going to add that. I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. Uh, giving up, well, that's a bit of a harder challenge. I, I'll have to think about donuts, mm -hmm. maybe vegetables. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we'll think that through, but I think it's good to think about things that yes. distract us yes. so that we can focus more on Jesus. Yeah, I love that. Vegetables, great idea. Maybe I'll take that up too. Okay, so then as we approach Lent and we think about the context that we find ourselves, all the things happening around the world, around the country, here at home, in our own church community, I'm just wondering, how do you navigate those two things hand in hand? What does Lent mean to us as we kind of find ourselves in the context mm -hmm. that we're in? Yeah. Lent um, gives us space, as we said, to focus on Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives us a space to focus on the suffering aspect mm. that Jesus endured mm -hmm. for, for us. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I think that as we look at our world, 
Uh, and there's just uh, so many examples of brokenness and suffering in our world. Uh, we think of what's going on in Europe right now, the right. war in Ukraine. Um, my goodness, just another reminder of the many places of suffering. When you think about the things that so many have endured over the pandemic yes. season, and still now, there's a lot of brokenness and yeah. pain. When you think about the life of our church right now, uh, there is a sense of, of brokenness, a sense of, of um, struggling. Uh, I think in all of those aspects, there is a reality to life of suffering. And when I think about Lent, I think about Jesus being Jesus-centered. Uh, Hebrews 12, 2 comes to mind. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. In Jesus, we have the meeting place of both suffering, the reality of suffering, but also that sense of hopeful healing um, that we look forward to. Uh, Lent... Um, is followed by Easter, the sense of hope, the sense of resurrection, new life. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's not just experiencing suffering for suffering's sake, but suffering we bring to Jesus. Jesus journeys with us. Uh, Isaiah 53 says that he's the wounded healer. Yeah. And, and we, we meet both suffering and hopeful healing in Jesus. And that's what I want to be focusing on uh, in this Lenten season. Wow. How, how fantastic in the middle of all of our pain and suffering, both that we experience as well as what's going on around us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. I so appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. Well, thanks, Daryl. Thank you so much for spending time again today. It's always good to chat. You're welcome. We live in a world that is beyond our control, and life is in a constant flux of change. So we have a decision to make. Keep trying to control a storm that's not going to go away, or start learning how to live within the rain. Glenn Pemberton, Hurting with God. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 10. Barns burnt down. Now I can see the moon. Mizuda Masahide. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? Psalm 22. As the Spirit laments within us, so we become, even in our self isolation, small shrines where the presence and healing love of God can dwell. N.T. Wright I am worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched, my eyes fail, looking for my God. Psalm 69 When brokenness becomes your life, lament helps you turn to God. It lifts your head and turns your tear-filled eyes toward the only hope you have, God's grace. 
Mark Vrogop. O oh God, why have you rejected us forever? Psalm 74. Hope is delicate suffering. Amiri Baraka. Take heart, for I have overcome the world. Jesus. Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to the beginning of our new series, Hope, where we're journeying through the, the, the Lent, the Lenten season, and engaging with these spiritual practices, these rhythms of faith, uh, some of which might seem very, very um, foreign. Even the notion of Lent, uh, maybe this is like your first time uh, checking out a church, maybe you're listening online or you're a visitor to one of our parishes, and you're like, I, what does that even mean? Lent is the season, it literally means lengthening, is extending and stepping into the suffering of Jesus and journeying with Him as a community uh, towards resurrection and healing and hope, which is the end of the story. But we name that this is the in-between, this is the now and not yet, whether it be in um, the reality of the world right now, maybe it's, you know, for you as you think of the word, as you think of this posture of like suffering alongside, of long suffering, you know, it's the day-to-day -day monotony of a city that just continues to drive by, of urban poverty, of day in, day out, the same thing. God, where are you? What are you doing? Maybe it's the invasion of Ukraine and the disparity of power and suffering that people are are going through right now, and you're wondering, like, how could we be talking about anything else? How does the world just continue to roll on when so many people are in the in-between space of tragedy, of suffering, of death, of violence? Or maybe for you, and this is all too real, where you have experienced pain, where the season of lament has been uh, a long one for you. I want to encourage you, invite you to close your eyes right now. Wherever you're at, maybe you're listening uh, later on and you're, you know, at home in your living room, close your eyes right now, or here together at one of our parishes, close your eyes right now, and let's slow down for just a second. When you hear the word lament, what image does that conjure up? When you hear the word lament, what feeling does that bubble to the surface? When you hear the word lament, what season are you snapped back to? Or what associated word comes to mind? I want you to hold on to that word, that image, that phrase, whatever bubbled up there by the Spirit. I want you to hold on to that throughout our time uh, together this morning. And I'll make mention right now, this is a trigger warning. Um, I'm hopeful that we will end on a note of hope, of care and connection for each other. But this sermon, this teaching is going to be intentionally heavy which I don't know that we always create a lot of space for uh, in our faith communities, maybe even our church. I remember a few years ago, um, I was journeying with a very good friend of mine who went through uh, just calamity, just calamity, suffering and suffering. She'd had a very difficult family life, uh, and then one of her like, closest uh, confidants and friends died suddenly. And I remember thinking, like, God, why her? Like, why? How is it possible that there's more for her to handle? Like her whole life has been lament. And then a short time after that, maybe a month or so, we were having coffee uh, and connecting with some other friends, all of whom were Christians and all of whom were, were well intent, well intent. And one of our mutual friends kind of like came up to her and patted her on the shoulder and said, I heard what you've gone through. That's really tough, but don't worry, you'll get through it. Jesus is Lord and walked away. None of that's untrue, right? None of that is untrue. However, I remember looking at her and seeing her face kind of drop, and she kind of just kind of sighed, smiled, and I looked at her and I was like, I don't feel like that was helpful. And she was like, yeah, it wasn't, but I understand. 
people struggle with their own pain, much less someone else's. So that's kind of typical of the responses that I've got in this season. And so when I think of the word lament, that is the word that sticks with me. Struggle. Now maybe for you it's, it's something else. Maybe for you it's less specific or more specific, or maybe for you, like you are, um, you know, one of those people that we as a community, those of us who are struggling, need to lean in and lean on. You're like, yes, but, but there's goodness, there's grace in this season, and amen, we agree. It's fascinating that as I was studying for this, uh, this series and also this sermon, I don't think, um, I don't think I recognize the, the meta-narrative, the overall story of lament that God invites us into in the Bible. The scripture is rife, is, is full of stories of honest crying out, of putting those words into phrases, of expressing our heartbreak to God. In fact, there's this whole book called Lamentations, a whole book called Lamentations that uh, is, is a, a breathtaking group of poems um, that focuses just on this, like, why so much pain? In fact, the Hebrew word for lament, uh, the, lamentations is, a, is a, a Greek word that's been rendered into English, but the Hebrew word for it is, is just how. So lament literally means how, which is fascinating because I think, I, I think our minds, are, for myself, I, I move very quickly towards why, like what is the reason? It's math, this plus this equals this, and if it doesn't equal this, then it, we should go back and figure it out. But the Hebrew posture is how? How do we get here? How did this happen? And how do we navigate through this together? So when you think of the word lament, and you think of your experience, especially if you're a person of faith, how do those two things come together? What have your experiences been, especially in a community of faith? You know, we don't often talk about these things. Like, you know, when it, t- when it comes to the postures, the rhythms of, of um, connecting with each other in community and with Jesus, joy, yes. Worship, yes, for sure. Gladness, hope, victory, grace, all the things, yep. But when is the last time we honestly, openly, and unashamedly lamented these things? Suffering. The, the plans that didn't happen, the grief of things that we thought like would never happen, and now they are happening. The pain of things shifting and changing, the ways that we couldn't see or sense or hear God, things that made us feel like not whole, times where we experienced maybe deep and catastrophic loss. My friends, the point is not why, the point is not necessarily speeding through these feelings, but the point is how. How do we stay in it? How do we see God at work even in our pain and in our lament? My friends, there's room for God in all of this. There's room in our faith for it. There's room in the grace of Jesus for all of this. I'll invite you to turn in your Bibles to Lamentations. Uh, We're going to start in chapter 5. We're going to jump all over the place. Um, It's after Isaiah and Jeremiah, so it's in the Old Testament, the, the right half of the book, uh, and then it's just a very short and really um, obscure book of poems. Now, when you read Lamentations, it's what this is. This is like an acrostic group of poems that features four characters in the book, only three of which are mentioned. And it starts out in a, a very real and raw tone. So Lamentations chapter one, verse one, <laughs> here's how it goes. Be encouraged. Jerusalem, once so full of people, is now gone, deserted, destroyed. She, who was once great among the nations, now sits alone like a widow. Once the queen of all the earth, she's now a slave. She sobs through the night. Tears stream down her cheeks among all of her family, loved ones, and lovers. There is no one left to comfort her. All of her friends have betrayed her and become her enemies. Judah, Jerusalem, has been led away into captivity, oppressed with cruel slavery. She lives among foreign nations and has no place of rest. Her enemies have chased her down, and she has nowhere left to turn. What a Hallmark card that is. Now, this is not happenstance. The, the, the context for the book of Lamentations is looking back, most likely it's the, the prophet uh, Jeremiah who's looking back on the destruction of Jerusalem, the most devastating experience that the faith world has ever been through. And so what happened is in the year, um, you know, in the, the 5th or 6th century BCE, 
Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians. War took over, and the known faith world, the epicenter, the locus of where God is and how God is meant to be a blessing, was flattened. And modern warfare at the time had evolved to a different level of cruelty. Now, um, ancient cities were, were walled in, and so there was no like you know planes or helicopters or uh, drone bomb drops, which we're seeing so much of today. It was um, you know horses, infantry. Uh, you, you sieged a city. You tried to get through the wall. And the Babylonians, in particular, had a, a strange and destructive uh, methodology in how they did it. They would besiege the walls, which actually became a very normative part of warfare after the Babylonian conquer of Jerusalem. And so what that meant is um, the, the army would go to the city walls, and these city walls were quite high, so you had to make effort to get over it. Typical warfare at the, warfare at the time was bring ladders or or, um, uh, you know, structures to get up and over the wall and then fight and fight and fight. And it usually resulted in a lot of uh, death on both sides. But the Babylonians would besiege the wall and then build a secondary structure, almost like a reverse moat against the wall of Jerusalem. And then they would wait. Eventually, once, and then they would, they would destroy, uh, they would cut off all supply lines. And eventually, the people inside the city would have to come out and they would be killed, and rinse and repeat and rinse and repeat. The same thing would happen over and over and over until eventually the, the loud cries in the city became faint and weak. The Babylonians would set up camp right outside the wall, besiege the city, build a secondary wall, and wait until the city starved and died. And then eventually they would get over the wall, um, kill every... Um, man inside of the city structure and usually take women and children uh, away to Babylon um, to be enslaved. So imagine as an Israelite, you have grown up here and God is with and for us. God is using us to be a blessing to the entire world. This is where God lives in his holy splendor. And then at the end of this year, this experience, there is nothing left. The whole town, the whole city the temple is left in ruin, burned to the ground, and you as a people group are taken away from everything that you've ever known. And so in the story we hear four voices. One is the woman, is the daughter of Zion, or the, the, the bride of Jerusalem, who represents like purity and innocence, and like God is doing something, God is birthing new life. And then there's the man who, who represents power, uh, you know, and purpose. And then there's the narrator, or like the cosmic voice, who it's like the 30,000 foot view of everything that's happening. And then there's God, and God says nothing. Nothing. God does not answer the why, but fascinatingly, God enters into the how, the lament of his people. I think that's helpful for us, my friends, especially in this season, uh, the world the way that it is, uh, these like violent repeat um, actions that we as humanity cannot seem to step past the, qu the quickness that we try and escape pain and suffering and move wholly towards pleasure. I just want to feel, look, act, seem better than I am. And lament, Lamentations calls us back, this posture of lament calls us back to sitting, slowing down, and to being authentically ourselves. What does it mean to stay in laments? Not just speeding towards the why, but speeding, staying within the how. How is God speaking? How is God entering into our suffering? How is God moving us towards hope? Lamentations is an ancient tradition, a practice of naming what is and what isn't, what should and should not be, but more so it's, it's how we're meant to do this together. When hope and, see, and healing seems too far away, even when God seems silent, we are meant to do this together. In Jewish tradition, lamentations, and even like the, the Lenten season, is like it's, the, lang it's the, the language of thinness, the language of the border, the authentic us-ness, the words and pain and cries that bubble up from the depths of our being. You may have heard it said, when we don't deal with our pain, it goes into the basement and lifts weights. 
Lament is the coming up to the surface, is being honest, integral with where we are in the space between, where we know we should be, and the road to hope that I hope we are all on. And so I think the narrative of, of Scripture is helpful in three ways. Number one, uh, prayer. Number two, petition and protest. And number three, lament is the acknowledgement of pain. Um, if you're not in a home church, this is a great commercial for you to get in home church. We need to be in tight together, especially in this season, brothers and sisters. And you're going to be talking um, lots through uh, the book of Lamentations and a couple others. But just for the sake of time, uh, I want to just give a high-level overview and then um, walk us through an exercise in silence as well. So lament is prayer. If you skip over to uh, Lamentations chapter five, which is the ending of the poem. Now, typically in our Western sensibilities, when, when we're resolving a poem or a song or, or a dance, there's, there's like a, an up and to the right uh, trajectory. Like we want to feel the goodness of like, yes, but. Despite all these troubles, yes, but. Here's where we're landing. And the ending of uh, Lamentations goes like this. And this is the voice of like the, 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 the narrator, the, the community the community praying together, uh, just like this. Joy is gone from our hearts, our dancing has turned to mourning, the crown has fallen from our head, woe to us for we have sinned. Because of this our hearts are faint, because of these things our eyes grow dim and sad, for Mount Zion which lies desolate, the city of Jerusalem, which lies desolate with jackals prowling all over it. You, Lord, reign forever though, your throne endures from generation to generation, why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore us to yourself, Lord, that we may return, renew our days as of old, unless you've utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. And then if you flip over, nope, that's where Lamentations ends. Now, it's fascinating um, this might seem unsettling if you've never heard this before, but our Jewish brothers and sisters, we have so much to learn from this ancient tradition. Our Jewish brothers and sisters, this is a regular rhythm in their uh, liturgy of faith and practice, is to set aside time and even once annually to commemorate the experience of lamentations, of what does it mean to be authentically connected, to call out in prayer, and does God invite that? Yes, He does. Now, depending on the religious tradition that you grew up with, maybe, you know, you hear a prayer, you hear scripture like that, and you're like, whoa, that is a, that's a, you know, a non-coffee morning. What, what's going on there? Or maybe in your religious tradition or even in, like, you know, the way that you grew up with parents, you see God as, like, clenched fist angry. You don't talk back. This is far from the picture that we see in scripture Throughout the Lament, uh, Lamentations uh, poem, we see this rhythm of prayer, lament as prayer, this rhythm of prayer that these people are calling out to God, explaining what they see as wrong, confessing their own hardships, their own doubts, their own struggle, their own grief, but then returning to partnership with God and with each other. And memorializing it that we lament, we sit in the pocket of grief because it's healthy, it's helpful for us to be in it together, not just to speed through it individually as fast as possible. The fascinating thing about lament as prayer is that it, it invites public mourning. It invites us to, to externalize what is internal. It invites to the surface what maybe has gone down to the basement and has been lifting weights. It exposes our truest selves being given permission to say, God, this hurts. Hear our cries, hear our prayer, O Lord. How long will you reject us? You reign forever, help us. Imagine if that was the language of our prayer connectedly. Imagine if that was the semblance of like our community uh, moving forward in our present season and the season to come. If instead of individualizing our pain, we linked arms, connected with each other, knowing that God is moving us towards hope, but knowing that God is here in the pain and the in-between and the lengthening phase of lament. Number two, lament is petition. 
Uh, just for the sake of time, of time I'm not going to read through uh, Lamentations chapter 3, um, but I invite you to do so. It's fascinating and unsettling and uncomfortable. Lamentations chapter 3 is the voice of the man, and this is the man petitioning. I thought we were strong. God, where are you? Are you sleeping? Uh, this is the prophet Jeremiah, most scholars think, who also said, God, you have ruined my life. You have to change things. Wake up. Do something. God is here for it, doesn't correct, instead enters in, gives space for, and feels it too. It's fascinating that the, the male voice like straddles the line of reverence for God, but also petitioning and pushing on God as well, like, do you not see this? What are you doing? How are you acting? This isn't right. And then it becomes the communal voice as well, the communal voice of protest, correction, and care of people saying, this can't be the way. This can't be the way. What are we going to do about it? Petition and protest and holding each other, saying, God, help us through it. Wake up, Lord. Lead us towards healing and hope and resurrection and correction and care. I think, once again, this is one of the ways that we push against meaningless suffering and pain of, of slowing down, not speeding through it, but to dignify it, to look at each other and our pain and our suffering and saying, this is the human experience. I see you. I'm here with you. I'm not willing to just give pad answers, but I'm willing to suffer alongside, long suffering, long obedience to the other, long care for the other in the same direction, in and through suffering and pain, preparing the way for remedy and healing, naming what's wrong, out of order and inhumane, reminding the community of where we've been and where we're meant to return, and then most importantly, exposing what stands in the way of hope. Exposing what stands in the way of hope. And for many of us, what stands as the biggest barrier towards hope is pain, is the difficulty, the suffering, the death, the loss, the tragedy, the inequality, the silence of pain that we've experienced. I'm going to go out on a limb and say when we pictured a word or a phrase or an idea at the beginning, it probably wasn't very hard to come up with something. Now, in the notion of, like, ancient Judaism... If you ask the questions, if we were to hop in a time machine and go back to like the 5th, 6th century BCE and we ask like, where are the gods in all of this? Outside of Judaism, where are the gods in all of this? Most likely, likely the answer would have been like, well, somewhere else. They're somewhere else and they're angry and it's this balance of trying to appease and serve and connect but also stay distant. The gods are transcendent, elsewhere, uninvolved. And in this story, and certainly the story and the experience of Jesus, everything changes. In Jesus, we see that God enters into pain, doesn't stand apart from it. Are you familiar with this phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I see some nodding heads. This is one of the last things that Jesus says on the cross, as the people that he has came to save, as the religion that he has come to tear down and reconcile back to the heart of God, are killing him. He is on the cross, sacrificing himself in the name of love and other-centeredness, and he repeats this phrase out of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why do you stand so far off? So what is Jesus saying there? In the tradition of the rabbis at the time, in the tradition of the Jewish martyrs, Jesus is entering into the suffering story of Judaism at the time, saying, I am here with, I don't stand apart. I'm calling out a, a, a phrase that would have been common in, in Jewish funerals, saying, God has always been here, and now Jesus, God made flesh, is entering into human pain and suffering and redeeming it, reconciling it towards Hope, not speeding through it, suffering alongside, in, through, and with, not somewhere else. This is a lengthening, an expanding of the suffering of humanity made real and visible in the person of Jesus. And so when we read that, which can be unsettling, when we read Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is, you know, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We can 
get confused. We can say, like, what is this? Is this Jesus doubting? Is this Jesus, like, pushing back, feeling the absence uh, of God, feeling alone? Maybe. Is this Jesus holding a clenched fist to the sky and saying, you deserted me? Maybe. Most likely, this is Jesus entering fully in to the feelings, those word pictures of his brothers and sisters, of us today in the midst of pain, not breezing through it, but entering into it, standing in solidarity and union with community in the midst of devastating human pain and suffering in a world that has turned upside down, but moving humanity towards hope, slowly. When I was young, um, my sister died. My parents were uh, new to faith. We had just started um, taking part in this faith community. And, uh, you know, and it was right around this season, um, like this calendar season right now. I just talked to my parents this past Thursday, and we were kind of reminiscing what that felt like, what it felt like to lose an 11 year old daughter, a sister to, to me friend to many, and the rhythms that you go about, like, why, how, what, 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 did the, what is the purpose? She had gone to a friend's house. They had, like, a, a little friend sleepover. She came back to our house, our family home, mentioned that she wasn't feeling well. They took her to the doctor. The doctor was like, it's probably just a flu, a cold. Um, don't worry. Take her back home. She got kind of progressively worse. They went back to the hospital. The hospital said, we'll admit her and ran an IV just to keep her hydrated. My parents got sent back home to just get some rest. In the middle of the night, they got a phone call that Sandy was critical to come back, and my parents got there just as soon as she passed away. My God, my God, Why? But my parents' experience of the story was certainly those questions like we, that we just still don't have answers to. But was more impactful for them to this day was not the why, it was the how. Now, you remember they were new Christians at the time, had just, um, you know, been part of this church community, and the first person there at the hospital as Sandy passed away was uh, our pastor, this, this spiritual caregiver as part of our community. And what he said to them has never left them to this day. He said, I have no answers for you. I don't know why this has happened, but till the day that I die, I'm committing to being with you, to being alongside you in your pain and grief. And that's legit. He has been. Like, we just talked to him a few, like, this is years and decades and decades ago, and he is still connected to our family. Many times in our, in our faith journey or, or even in our faith communities, we want to speed towards answers. We want resolve, quickness. Let's fix it. Let's get through it. But maybe the better thing for us as a faith community as we journey with Jesus and, and link arms with people who are struggling and suffering is not that like, well, everything happens for a reason, but instead is the reason I'm here is to journey with you, to care for you in and through this. Have you noticed all of these words and phrases? These are the words of our community. And it's fascinating, more often than not, when when we go through suffering, what is our tendency? Is our tendency to sit in the pocket of these words, or is our tendency to be like, no, I just want it to go away. I just wish it was, I just wish it was gone. Like, Lord, get us through us through this, heal it, let's be done with it. And instead, God says, no. The best way that you can love and serve and embody the ethic of Jesus is to stay in the pocket, to stay in the posture, to engage with lament. It is not the why that always helps, but the how. So brothers and sisters, when you find yourself struggling, suffering, when you find yourself walking with deep pain that has gone down into the basement, may you be encouraged that you serve and are loved by a God who invites it to come out. 
when you find yourself feeling alone and lament in this long period of in-between space with a fist to the air saying like, what is going on and why? May you know that you serve and are loved by a God that partners with you in this and suffers alongside us. And when you find yourself feeling physically, emotionally, mentally, and even spiritually alone, may you know and be encouraged that this is the mission of the church. This is the body of Christ that doesn't leave you or us alone, but that steps in, links arms, and says, let's do this together. And may you know that the grace of God, the love of God, the pain of God, and the covenant commitment of God is with you and with me and with us, always moving us towards hope. Amen. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for sharing with us and um, teaching us this morning. Wow, how powerful. We worship a God who suffers with us, who comes alongside. And I love that, um, that emphasis on doing this together. Let's link arms. Let's do this together. We are not alone in our suffering. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, um, it's been so good to be together today really, really good. As Jimmy mentioned in the teaching, if you are looking for a home church or you've been considering, let this be the time. Now is the time. Uh, go to the meetinghouse.com slash home church to get all the information there, whether they're online, kind of global home churches or in person uh, as a part of a local parish, all the information is there. Hey, I um, am praying for you. I'm cheering for you, celebrating you. Uh, morning with you. We are in this together. I hope um, you have a great week in all of those seasons, in all of those ways, and we'll see you next time. Take care.